Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my lecture series on sustainability issues in energy. I've been on a little bit of a hiatus because the semester happened and I was putting this class together, but now the semester is over and I'm ready to start uh, keep up the recordings. So thank you all for your patience. In today's lecture, we're going to continue talking about geothermal energy. And the topic of this lecture is going to be deep geothermal wells. So just to refresh your memory, um, over the past couple of uh, lectures, we've talked about shallow geothermal wells, um, you know, ground heat collectors, uh, two well systems, uh, heat pumps, uh, heat exchangers, and that sort of thing. Now we're going to talk about some of these deeper systems. So we've got both deep geothermal probes, which are just these single wells, and then what's known as a hydrothermal doublet. And um, a hydrothermal doublet is a little bit different from these geothermal probes that we've been talking about. So in the geothermal probe, the working fluid circulates down the probe and exchanges heat with the subsurface and then comes right back up. In a hydrothermal doublet, you're actually using the subsurface as your heat exchanger. And so you're pumping uh, your working fluid, typically water, down and just letting it go into the subsurface formation and then with your producing well, you are producing hot fluids from the subsurface. And so the heat exchange takes place over this much larger uh, volume here. So it gives you a lot more um, a lot more power. And in fact, it can give you, you know, maybe up to about a megawatt of electrical power, which is, you know, quite a bit larger than we what you get with these shallow systems. Um, uh, typically, these are, you know, more than 400 meters in depth. Um, we'll talk about enhanced geothermal uh, in uh, maybe a couple of lectures from now, but this is what we're talking about right now. So now, rather than doing this kind of on a residential scale, um, we are looking at much larger scale and deeper um, drilling activities. And so you really need to plan where you're going to drill because you want to drill somewhere where you have a really, really good source of heat. So you want to start out by looking at regional maps to look for anomalies either in heat flow or geothermal gradient, which will tell you where you've got a spot that you might be more prone to having, you know, hotter subsurface. Um, once you've identified, you know, kind of high graded some large scale areas, you can look at existing seismic and borehole data to get some idea of how deep you're going to drill, what type of rocks you're going to be drilling into, what the properties of those rocks are. Um, you might need to acquire new data if, if you really need to. And then finally, once you're ready, you can actually drill. So let's talk a little bit about the strategy here. So when you're looking for anomalies, either in heat flow or geothermal gradients, you have to remember that hotter is better. So if you can get away with not drilling as deep to get to rocks of a particular temperature, you're going to have a less expensive and less complicated operation. So um, generally, we're looking for fluids that are hotter than 120 degrees Celsius um, to be able to generate electricity. Um, if you're below that temperature, you can still use uh, some kind of a heat exchanger or a heat pump. But if you want to be able to use those fluids directly um, for power generation, you need to be at that temperature. And you know, for those of you who are wondering, yes, this is above the boiling point of water, but um, in the subsurface, you're under pressure. And so the water can actually still be liquid at 120 Celsius if it's under sufficient pressure. Now, if it's too hot, um, you're actually going to be producing steam and not water. We'll talk about this later. This is known as a high enthalpy um, geothermal situation, but we're not going to deal with that. We'll deal with that later when we talk about some of the stuff going on in um, Iceland. Okay, so since I'm at the University of Texas, I'm going to focus on Texas right now, but you can remember that you could apply this to any part of the world. So what we're looking at here on the left is a map of geothermal gradient. So the um, hotter colors here are obviously going to be higher. This is in degrees Celsius per kilometer. Um, so you can see that along the Gulf Coast and particularly in South Texas, we've got some regions of very high geothermal gradient. Um, whereas in West Texas, like Permian Basin, Panhandle, um, those areas, we have relatively low geothermal gradients. And so um, if you're thinking about doing geothermal um, development in Texas, 
you're probably either going to want to look at East Texas up here or probably um, South Texas, where you've got hot rocks closer to the surface. Um, here's a map of showing temperatures at 12,000 feet below the surface. Um, and again, we're looking for that 120 degrees Celsius um, isotherm. So we're going to be looking for this kind of tan color or above. And you can see again that, you know, um, South Texas is really where it's at as far as, um, you know, hot temperatures and high geothermal gradient um, in Texas. So now that we've identified an area that we want to look at, let's see what existing data exist. Um, this is a map of um, wells that have geothermal gradient data that are publicly available. So there's 29,630 of them. Um, these are archived by the Texas Railroad Commission, which for those of you who don't know, is the state regulatory agency um, in charge of regulating the oil and gas industry. There's um, historical reasons why they've retained the name the Railroad Commission, even though they're the oil and gas regulator that we're not gonna get into, but that's what we're, uh, that's what we're looking at now. So um, this uh, map here, you can see that in this area down in South Texas with high geothermal gradient, there is a lot of existing wells. So this is good. Maybe we can look at some existing data and figure out maybe where we might want to drill a, um, a hydrothermal doublet down there. So one of the things we can look at is what's called well logs. So when you drill an oil or gas well, um, usually what happens is once you've drilled the well, but before you put the casing and the cement in there and everything that you need to produce the hydrocarbons, you will run what are called um, logs, wireline logs. And this involves um, sending a series of tools down the well, and they're connected to a mobile unit at the surface by a wire, and they transmit data about the subsurface back up to the surface. And so you can measure all kinds of interesting things um, about mechanical properties, fluid flow properties, uh, lithology, fluid types, you know, all kinds of great stuff that you can measure. Um, I started my career in the oil and gas industry actually as a wireline logger operating one of these units here. So this is what the, this is what the data looks like um, that uh, are recorded by um, these tools. And there's a lot of information on here. Uh, we'll go through some of it um, in a minute, but you've got information on lithology, You've got information on electrical conductivity. You've got information on porosity. So there's a lot of good stuff. Um, I also worked for several years as a petrophysicist analyzing uh, these types of logs. So this looks uh, very familiar to me here. Okay, so let's um, go through a little exercise here. Let's find a random well down here in Zapata County, uh, which is in that zone of high uh, geothermal gradient. So we can find the uh, the logs for these wells on the Railroad Commission website. So I went ahead and did that. This is just a random well in Zapata County. You can see right there. Um, this is what's called the header of the well log. And this is going to tell you all kinds of good information. It's going to tell you the service company that ran the log. It's going to tell you what logs were run, uh, information about the well, where it is, survey location. Um, all kinds of good stuff down here as well about you know temperature, depth, when the log was recorded, um, all that good stuff. Um, the important stuff that we're going to look at here are the maximum recorded temperature. So you can take this as a pretty good indication of the temperature at the bottom of the well, and also the depth where that was recorded. So we had 244.7 degrees Fahrenheit. That's pretty hot. And then the depth we see that it was recorded at a depth of 9,206 feet. And the um, that depth is referenced relative to what's called the Kelly bushing, which is essentially the thing on the rig floor that turns the pipe when you're drilling. So the, um, the Kelly bushing is 18 feet above ground level. Um, so you can think of you know, the drilling rig as being having some elevation to it above ground level. And so if you want to figure out how deep this is below ground level, you have to subtract that 18 feet from 9206. 
Um, so that gives us a depth of 9188 feet. And with a typical ground temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, this gives us a geothermal gradient of 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit per 100 feet, um, or 49 degrees Celsius per kilometer. Now, that's pretty high. Um, those of you all who remember my lectures on uh, CCUS, I would talk about how one degree Fahrenheit is a, per 100 feet is a typical geothermal gradient. So we're well above that. So this is probably a pretty good spot for uh, geothermal. Okay, so let's look at the logs. Here's a really simplified log just to show you all the sorts of things we look at. So on the left-hand side here, we have a measurement of natural gamma ray radiation. Um, it's in units of uh, gamma API, which is an American Petroleum Institute specified gamma ray unit. But basically this is a tool that just listens for gamma rays that are naturally emitted by potassium-40, thorium-232, and uranium-238, which are the two main naturally occurring gamma ray emitting elements. Um, these elements tend to be more abundant in clays relative to sands. And so anywhere that we have a higher gamma ray reading, that's a good indication that we've got more clay in the formation. So that's probably a shale. Um, if we want to look for zones that have better permeability, we want to look for zones that don't have as much clay because, you know, clay has really small grains and it clogs up the pores and that sort of thing. Um, so anytime you're going to be injecting or producing fluids, whether it be oil, gas, or hot water, you want to look for low gamma ray. Okay. Now, the other thing that we have to worry about is because there's active oil and gas production here, there's obviously going to be a lot of um, you know, layers here that have oil or gas in them. And one thing we do is we can measure the electrical resistivity of the formation. And the way you can think about this is that if the rock is full of salt water, it will be conductive. So it will have low resistivity. Um, if it's got oil or gas in it, hydrocarbons are insulators and they don't conduct electricity. And so you'll get a higher resistivity reading when you've got hydrocarbons in the formation. Now, there's other things that can also cause high resistivity, namely low porosity. Um, so you've always got to be careful about that. But you can make some first order interpretations about what you think are going to be the fluids that are present in some of these uh, layers that have low gamma ray. So, you know, just a preliminary interpretation might be that this zone at the top with low gamma ray, this is a gas bearing sand, low gamma ray, high resistivity. Um, here's another one down here. It's thinner. Um, this vertical axis is depth in feet. So you can see that's quite a bit thinner than this one. Um, once we get down here, we've got some layers with relatively low gamma ray. Uh, that don't have as high resistivity. And these might be zones where you could think about um, trying to produce just hot water from this. You don't want to be producing hydrocarbons in your geothermal well. Um, so you'd probably want to go out and collect some more data to, to uh, see if this might be a good target. Now, another thing you can do is once you've looked at a bunch of well logs, you can start to try to make correlations about how connect, how well connected and how large some of these sand bodies are. Because remember, we're using the subsurface as a gigantic heat exchanger. And so the more connectivity and the you know, greater extent of these sands you have, the better um, uh, they'll work as a heat exchanger. So this is typical kind of exploration geology type stuff where you look at a bunch of logs and then you try to correlate the different sand layers across them. So here's a map of a um, region in Zapata County and all these red dots, these are gas wells. And here's just an arbitrary cross section going through some of them. This is what the logs look like. So someone here has gone in and marked where all the sands are. They're color coded by temperature. Um, and you can start to try to make some, some guesses about you know, which of these sands are connected with each other. You can also make maps of you know, net thickness of sands. So um, I'm sorry, I said this, I misspoke earlier. This is Hidalgo County that we're looking at in this example. So this is a map, it's contoured um, of net thickness of sands greater at temperatures greater than 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, you know, obviously the hotter colors are going to be thicker sand. So here's a spot right here that might have a lot of potential, you know, production of geothermal fluids. So that's another thing you can do. Now, 
going away from the well log scale and looking at you know much larger scales, we can also use seismic data to interrogate the subsurface. Um, the way this works is that the Earth is more or less composed of different layers which have different properties. Um, this is certainly true of sedimentary rocks. And what you can do is you can impart acoustic energy into the subsurface um, on land. This is typically done with a, um, it's called a vibra sized truck. It's basically a big heavy truck with a, a heavy plate on the bottom that vibrates at a particular range of frequencies. Um, and that acoustic energy will, will propagate through the subsurface. Anytime it gets to a boundary between two layers that have different mechanical properties, some of that energy will be reflected and some of it will be transmitted. And you can set a series of receivers at the surface to listen for the reflected energy. Um, and so you'll get a recording of signal amplitude versus time corresponding to the reflections off each one of these interfaces. Um, and so then you can decompose that signal and figure out um, you know, what the properties are and where these, where these interfaces are. Um, now, you know, processing the data is a whole you know, field of study unto itself that I'm only peripherally familiar with, so I'm not gonna get into that. But um, suffice to say, it's you know, kind of a straightforward um, signals processing um, uh, uh, workflow that you would do on these. Okay, so the thing that we work with in seismic data is a property called impedance. Um, and um, usually we're dealing with compressional waves or P waves um, in you know, typical exploration seismic. And so the acoustic impedance is defined as the product of the density and the P wave velocity of a particular material. So if I have you know, I layers in my earth model, the impedance of the ith layer is just going to be the product of its density and its p-wave velocity. Now, um, the amount of energy that is reflected at an interface between two materials with different, um, different properties, like I have illustrated over here, um, it's a function of the contrast and impedance between the two layers. Um, the reflection coefficient, which is going to be the fraction of energy that is reflected, is given by this expression here, where it's the difference between the impedances of the two layers divided by the sum. Okay. Um, now, one thing you'll notice is that the reflection coefficient can be negative. So if the, um, if the layer below the interface has a higher impedance, you'll get a positive reflection. If, it, if this uh, layer has a lower impedance, you'll actually get a negative reflection. So the polarity of the acoustic wave will be reversed. Um, and so we can look at reflections in the seismic data to make interpretations about um, the, both the location of different horizons and also the properties of the rocks on either side. So things that influence the impedance are mineralogy. So the properties of the minerals that make up the rock. Um, the porosity of the rock, so you know how many holes it has in it, and then the type of fluid that's present, um, specifically the compressibility of that fluid. So um, a rock containing gas is going to respond differently than a rock containing water because gas is so much more compressible than water. So here's an example of some seismic data um, from a geothermal um, field in the Netherlands. This is the, uh, the Rotligen Formation, which is a... Um, uh, popular uh, geothermal target um, in that area. What we're looking at here is um, a seismic image with two ends of a hydrothermal doublet superimposed on it. Um, so we'll talk about the, um, the wells in a minute, but what we're looking at here is a slice through the earth. So the um, vertical axis here is depth, and then the horizontal axis is distance. And what we see here is that um, the uh, blue horizons are horizons where we have a negative impedance contrast. And then the red horizons are ones where we have a positive impedance contrast. So you can see there's you know, a very pronounced uh, negative polarity, polarity reflection right here. This is the top of the Rotligan formation, um, which is a um, you know, high porosity rock that is overlain by low porosity um, 
uh, cap rock, which I believe it's actually an evaporite um, cap rock. But what, what's been superimposed on the well trajectories here is actually a porosity log that's been estimated from a measurement of bulk density. Um, and you can see very clearly that above this horizon, the porosity is low. So it's color coded by the porosity value. So red is low. That's true over here. And it's also true over here. And immediately below that reflection, you can see this high porosity in both ends of the well. And so that's what's giving us this negative um, polarity reflection. It's going from a low porosity rock above to a higher porosity below, which presumably has a lower density and a lower P wave velocity. Um, and so this is what we would look at to try to better figure out how deep we want to drill these wells and what the property, expected properties of the rock are going to be um, when we find them. One other thing you'll notice is um, the distance between the two ends of the doublet here. Here's a 400 meter scale bar. So we are you know, approaching one and a half to two kilometers between these things. Um, these have been directionally drilled so that at the surface, um, they come back together. So they're being, you know, you're producing and injecting at the same location. But the reason you do this is that you want your, um, I don't know which one of these is the injector or the producer, but let's pretend this is the injection well. So you're injecting cold, relatively cold fluid down here to be heated up. And then at the producer, you're producing hot fluid that has exchanged heat with the subsurface down here. And you obviously don't want those to be too close to each other because you don't want to be producing some of your cold injected fluid um, in your producer well because that's not very efficient. So you want to figure out how far apart you need these wells to be. And that's going to be a function of the thermal conductivity of the rock and your anticipated injection rates and flow rates and all that good stuff. So this is a bit of an engineering problem here. Okay, so that's a little bit about how we select a location for a deep geothermal well and what all is involved in figuring that, that out. And so in the next lecture, we'll talk about drilling techniques um, used to drill both shallow and deep um, geothermal wells. So thank you for watching and I uh, hope to see you on the next one.